Vice Now, I am Dustin Baker. We are very close to the regular season, about less than two weeks away from regular season football. We are here with Thor Nystrom, who has been on the show since right before, right after the draft. So we want to get caught up with Thor. How are you, man? I'm doing well. How are you guys doing? Marvelous. And in the case I forget towards the end of the episode, where are you writing now? Uh, I'm at Fantasy Life now, uh, Matthew Barry's Fantasy Life, uh, mm-hmm. doing the same sorts of things, uh, the college football in the fall and the NFL draft in the spring. But yeah, check out uh, Fantasy Life. And is that the same site that merged kind of with Paul Tarchian's guillotine? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, it, and that was kind of like sliding doors, like kismet, I guess, because you know, I they, they, I was talking to them, and then apparently Charchian was talking to them too, and I do Fantasy Football Weekly with Charchian and those guys. So it was really cool, like, right around the same time that we both kind of, you know, joined Fantasy Life. Yeah, that's that's quite the flex for Fantasy Life, getting you two in there. And it's two Vikings fans, so we emphatically endorse it. We're uh, infiltrating. Yannick. We're infiltrating yeah. Fantasy Life. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Yannick, across the pond, how are you, sir? You're in charge of Purple PTSD. How's it been going? Oh, I'm doing great. Uh, can't wait to see the season finally starting. Yeah, we've gone through an odyssey, a roller coaster of Vikings themed events, let me tell you. Uh, so we're going to start to get into some of those with Thor, a noted Vikings fan foremost. Yannick, why don't you kick us off? We got about four or five things to cover with Thor. So I want to start with the quarterback position. Um, I know you have been. McCarthy's biggest fan. I'm probably like third. <laughs> um, so that totally sucks that he his emergence is delayed for a year. Um, but what do you think about Sam Darnold? What are your expectations for 2024? I, I think he's gonna have a decent season. Like I'm drafting him above where you know his ADP is in fantasy, for instance, a statistical season, right? Like just because the supporting cast is so good, the play car is so good. And the uh, the game scripts, I think, are, are going to be advantageous for the passing game as well. Uh, like I, what I, all I want as a Vikings fan for Sam Darnold is this year to play well enough that he garners a contract in free agency next off season that brings the Vikings back a comp pick, and I think that he'll do that. Um, yeah, so I, I I definitely think that the pieces are in place for him to have a, a solid statistical season for sure. Are you thinking? 25 touchdowns or a Kirk stat line. What's the, if he plays all 17 games, what do you have in mind there? Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, maybe just a bit South of that, but I, I mean, I don't, the guy's not going to be a disaster. I don't think, right. Like he has all the arm talent. You got some athleticism as well. And then the play calling and the supporting cast, I just feel like it's, that's the thing that's going to rise the tide of Darnold as you know, it's like, the the mistake that people made with Darnold in his uh, uh, draft class was thinking that Darnold was going to be this singular talent that rose the tide of his supporting cast. But it turns out that, you know, pr- we probably need to – he needs to be a game manager. And this is the first situation, I think, where the supporting cast and the play calling is well enough around him where he'll acquit himself okay. Do you think we'll – get to the point where we debate him or Nick Mullins, you know, heading into a game or we get to the trade deadline and the Trey Lance stuff starts. Do you think we'll even get there? I mean, it's possible. Yeah. If, if he flatlines in a game, uh, it, it's not like he, it's not like I believe he has a stranglehold on the job, even with McCarthy down, they're going to give him a bit of leash at the start of the season. But yeah, if, if he falters on the field, I, I do think the Mullins discussion begins like this is just I mean, it sucks to say like from the Vikings perspective, but this is a reset year. Right. Mm-hmm. And it was always going to be a reset yeah. year. You're carrying the most dead cap in the NFL. You're going through the quarterback transition next year is where you have all the cap room. Ostensibly, we'll have another top 10 pick and then JJ going into a second season. But yeah, th- this season, you just don't have the, the the help on hand, I think, to do better than that. Uh, my question here switches tied a little bit. I want to talk about Dalton Reisner, and I, I want to ask you about this because it appears because he's hurt or just hasn't done much this summer that he's trending toward a roster cut. Maybe you disagree, but with free agency two years in a row, he's been ignored. Why do NFL teams or general managers not like him? I think at, at this point, you you have a declining game 
combined with uh, the injury, the ongoing nagging injuries that he has, those two things, and then you have the thing where he seems like he's a good dude, and yet he's always getting into like – you know, miscommunication is the way he put it this offseason. He's like, oh, I signed this contract and, you know, I thought it was going to be this way, but then I got here and they did this. And he's like, he's telling the media, you know, and and th there was a thing at the end of his tenure with the Broncos where he got in the fight with the dude in the locker room. You know, I, I don't really know Dalton Risner, so I don't know exactly what that is. If there's like some Eddie Haskell there or if he, you know, uh, being deliberately subordinate in, in some of these like, uh, conversations with manage, I, I like, I don't know, but okay. I, if you're at that point in your career, you have to be the rock guy, right? You have to be the, um, there can be no miscommunications, right? Like you, you have to be like the leader, right? The veteran leader, he's heady. He's, you know, he comes to work and, and we, we never have to worry about him. And that does not appear to be the case with, with Dalton Risner. And so he either has to modulate his attitude, uh, in a nod to where he's at in his career, or I, I think his time in the NFL is, is about to be over. And I like that answer. Cause I've tried to make sense of it now for two straight off seasons, like to the naked eye, his pass protection is well above average, maybe not the run blocking. And for a team that has been starved for competent pass protection at guard for half a decade, it's like, what are we doing cutting this guy? Um, but then when it translates over to other general managers, just ignore him during free agency altogether. Uh, the attitude or the, the leadership qualities as an explanation kind of makes sense to me. That's what I think it is. Yeah, I, I think that stuff, whether it's true or not, I'm not saying it's true. I'm not like trying to, you know, like, again, I don't, I don't know Dalton Reisner from the outside looking in, he seems like, a good dude right but like these things keep cropping up and there are things within the building and my only thing would be dalton it is incumbent upon you now that you're not a difference making starter right you, you might be like a, a passable starter maybe or you might be a solid backup but that's where you're at right now uh you, it's on you to fix that stuff to make sure that it's not going forward that the organization can trust you like you have to be the guy where the the beat writers are like oh Dalton Reisner after practice was uh had uh Ed Ingram had his arm around Ed Ingram and he was you know explaining to him how not to uh start your pass up by stepping on the quarterback's feet you know whatever right like mm -hmm. uh he's teaching him stuff he's teaching him technical stuff we don't get that with Dalton Reisner it, it's always these miscommunications <laughs> you know it's like bro you can't do that no more you're gonna get cut yeah, he is notably uh, and surprisingly on the roster bubble. When I say surprising, I mean, if someone would have told us at the end of May, hey, he's going to be on the roster bubble, we'd be like, what are we doing here? Um, yeah, all right. I, yeah, agreed. Yannick, what's our next thing for Thor Nystrom of Fantasy Life? So I want to start with the draft. I mean, it's eight months to go, um, but you already mentioned a potential top 10 pick. Um, who are two guys that you think we should keep an eye out for? for the vikings yeah the so just in general this next draft class coming up 2025 it's absolutely loaded at defense last year was not it was the other way last year was loaded at quarterback receiver offensive line in particular offensive tackle and we had a record where the first defender wasn't taken until 15th or 16th by the colts when lots went off the board this, this the next class is totally flipped where it's awesome at defense and um, also running back, uh, which both fit what the, the Vikings need. The, the guy that I want is Travis Hunter from Colorado for the Vikings because he you knock out two birds with one stone with him. The, the biggest need on this team right now is a cornerback one, and it has been for a really long time. It's just a redundancy at this point, right? Like the cornerbacks have stunk for a long time. If you get Travis Hunter, you get your cornerback one. That thing is solved. But in addition, what he gives you is you don't have any wide receiver depth right now. Uh, you have the two guys, and then after that, it's it's sort of pray for rain. If you have Travis Hunter, a guy who starts both ways at Colorado and has his entire career, cornerback and wide receiver, he ain't going to be playing both ways in the NFL, but you can bring him in 15%, 20% of the snaps as your wide receiver three where you have Jefferson and Addison flanking him. And then of course, Hawkinson and Hunter. It, I mean, like if he was just a wide receiver, he would be a top 15 pick, 
with none of the quarterback cornerback utility. Um, and of course, vice versa, but you get that extra value by taking him. And that has to be baked into his a draft evaluation. And in particular, a team like the Vikings, where they're they have the crying out need, but then they have this ancillary need. You take care of both of them with that kid. So that's why he would be, you know, for, for me, and he's probably going to go in the top 10, might go in the top five a lot to see. Um, the, the other ones, uh, the, is interior defensive line is, you know, the, the big need. And this class is stacked with those. Um, the kid that I love is uh, Deion Walker from Kentucky because he's 6'5", 355 pounds. <laughs> and he moves like a dude who's like 60 pounds less than that. They, they dropped him into coverage a few times last year. And on one hilarious rep, a dude's coming across the middle and Walker blasts him right when the ball gets there. The quarterback gave this guy an all-time hospital ball, leading him right into Deion Walker. And Deion Walker blasts this kid, and the ball goes in the air, and one of his teammates grabs it and runs it back for a pick six. You don't – like, they weren't dropping Jordan Davis in coverage at Georgia. You know what I mean? Like, that kid's a different kind of an athlete at that size. So – the, the Vikings, the constitution of their defense, that is another just glaring need is that dude in the middle that will occupy uh, two guys on a running concept. So Ivan Pace can run behind them and zip around and, and is not encumbered by uh, blockers climbing up to the second level. I think he would be a really good fit. And then last two uh, uh, Michigan teammates, Graham uh, at, at the interior defensive line, that guy is a havoc wreaker. Um, so he would be a great fit as well. And then uh, Will Johnson, their cornerback, is totally locked down. So this is another season where you have to watch Michigan if you're a Vikings fan uh, for draft evaluation purposes. Do you expect uh, wherever they end up, I guess hopefully it's not in the top 10, do you expect them to first trade back? Um, or is it way too early to even speculate on that? Um, no, I don't think it's I don't think it's too early. Uh, I think it's uh, pragmatic, uh, especially if they have that top 10 pick. Mm -hmm. It gets it gets more difficult later on, of course, because you have the depreciation slot by slot. So if the Vikings way overachieve and this year and they're picking, you know, 22nd or 23rd, you're just you're not going to get a ton to flush out your picks, dropping back to 28 or 20. You want to drop back into day two, maybe a bit more. But, yeah, where the Vikings sit right now, you have the first round pick. Thank God they didn't – like, I, I just had to say something. There was all the people during draft season that were like, oh, give up whatever, you know, whatever it takes to move up into the top three. And I was like the, the voice out there that was like, no, 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 protect that first-round pick next year. You must protect that pick, uh, you know, first-round pick. And Vikings fans will see in April, like, that pick is going to bring back uh, a guy with perennial all-pro talent. Um, if you get the top 10, that's where in particular you can flesh that out. And maybe depending on the scenario, maybe even get a first round pick the following season. But yeah, where the Vikings are, you have the first round pick, you have the third round comp pick, and then you have two fifth round picks. And that's it. So you have the the four because all the moving around that Quasi did, they will absolutely explore a trade down. It, it just depends, right? Like it depends on what the scenario is, but um, I, I absolutely that is going to be explored. Flesh out those picks. Yeah, that's what I've been trying to prep the masses for because it's the simplest way to re recoup some of the Turner trade draft capital. All right, I want to do some rapid fire roster bubble scenarios because the cutdown deadline is Tuesday at uh, 3 p.m. and I'm going to give you a litany of Vikings players here. And you can you can tell me makes it or doesn't make it with maybe a, a sentence or two. We don't have to launch into a speech on each guy, but I want to just basically get your takes on the roster bubble. So uh, probably the most popular uh, because of last weekend, Lewis Seen. Um, I'm gonna go if he if he's not traded, then I'm, I'm gonna go ninety percent. Uh, I I think that one is more coming down to can they get the trade for him or not. Uh, But yeah, that's yeah. I mean, he's going to be on a roster. It's either do they keep him or do they trade him? But uh, if I'm factoring the trade odds in, then man, you got to go right to around a coin flip, right? Like, mm -hmm. I, I, they're going to listen. Um, I, you know, after what we saw, like, I don't, I, I wasn't as pumped to trade him, of course, as I was before. <laughs> but now he, now he's got value, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, th somewhere around a coin flip that he's on the Vikings is week one roster. 
Okay. And then uh, to clarify, these are your predictions, not necessarily your recommendations. Duke Shelley. Uh, Duke is in trouble, I think. Duke, I, I think he's on the outside looking in because of, in particular, McLaughlin. I think McLaughlin has bypassed him. Oh, it's not just I think. The Vikings official depth chart they put out has <laughs> McLaughlin above Duke Shelley. Like, they're not being shy about it. Um, at that point, between that development and then the signing of Gilmore, it's like, yeah, Duke Shelley was higher on that pecking order a couple weeks ago, but now it's like – you, to where you're on the bubble. And I, I think he's going to get caught on, on the outside looking in um, for sure. They'll bring him back on the practice squad. You know, if no other team uh, claims him, but um, odds that he's on the week one roster, like the regular roster, I, I'm going to go like 8% right now. Okay. Um, and he can, like you said, the practice squad is probably safe for him because no team really, I mean, he got cut by the Raiders last year before he ended up with the Rams. They only played like 70 snaps with the Rams. Uh, a popular guy two months ago who quiet this summer, Robert Tanyan. That's, yeah, I was hoping for more there. Um, Tanyan, I'm going to go, I'll probably go like 14%. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I think it's another numbers thing there. Even with the putting Hawkinson on, uh, I, you know, you open that spot or whatever, but you're still behind, of course, Oliver, you're behind Mont, you're behind Muse. And then it, it becomes a thing of like, will they carry, uh, Nikhil Harry? Will they carry probably not Sammy's Reyes, but I, I don't know. I, I just think you're, you're on the wrong side of the numbers there potentially here. Yeah. Um, I agree there. This one, there's a lot of, there's a couple Vikings writers, analysts that have, prefer a two quarterback approach maybe because it's easier to make a 53 man prediction what about jaron hall i think I, I mean like especially after the last game I, like he just has to convince the vikings that he's worth sinking another developmental year into right mm -hmm. like and if he came out next preseason and he's lighting it up maybe they can get a draft pick out of him um i'm probably gonna go higher on this than than other people i, I think Hall, it's like 58%. Yeah, I uh I'm I'm hoping they keep three quarterbacks because of, you know, what happened last year. They would hopefully learn their lesson and we don't have to like prep Josh Dobbs over the weekend or something like that. Uh James Lynch. James Lynch, uh I'm going to go like 5% or maybe even less. I I think the problem for him is the emergence of Levi Drake Rodriguez. And then um, you also, the Taki kid, I always pronounce his name wrong, Tamami, Tamami. Uh, but anyway, that kid has also emerged. So I think you've been bypassed by LDR. And then the Taki kid, they probably are, you know, if, if, if it came down there, I think you'd probably give it to the younger dude. Um, I, I think I think he's on the outside looking at him. Ryan Asamoah. I would like to be done with Brian Asamoah. Really? Okay. I, I got to be honest. Yeah. I That was a pick I didn't understand in the moment, and it turned out even worse than I thought it would. Uh, but I, I, he's aided by the lack of off-ball linebacker depth, right? Like some of this stuff, it's just totally situational, and that happens to be a place where the, the, the depth stinks. Even if – so Dallas Gann is the guy that I think has a better shot to make the roster than people think. But you, you're still going to keep two guys, uh, the backup off-ball linebackers. I, I, yeah, I mean, this one's high. I, I, I think it should be. I should think it should be lower. But I'm going to go, uh, 88 percent on Asma. That, that he stays. Yes. Okay. And then the last one I have is a Caleb Evans because you like McLaughlin so much. I, I think he's making the roster because okay. I, I, I think it's you know you're going to have Evans, you're going to have uh, McLaughlin for sure as, as the backups there um, and Moreau. And then it's like a uh, nation, right? Like, you know um, but yeah, I, I do think a Caleb uh, is, you know, near the top of that pecking order. So I I'm going to go 99% on him. It sounds like if you were to script a Vikings 53 man roster, you'd end up with six CBs. Potent. I mean, what, what are we designating word as? Um, safety. Safety. Mm -hmm. um yeah probably six yeah 
Yeah, I, I I think six is the right number. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, for the if you get down to the minutia of doing the fifty three man, that's where it gets dicey. If you want to keep seeing, especially um, if you keep six corners, it's tricky to do six safeties. Um. All right, Yannick. What else we got for Thor? So at wide receiver, um, we've seen Christian Jackson emerge as this real uh, receiving threat. Um, but we've also seen uh, the coaches praise Trent Sherfield for his blocking specifically. Um, Jalen Naylor is looking good. Brandon Powell. Do you think they keep all six? Do you have another sleeper like, I don't know, Jay Sean Jones or something? Um, what do you think the wide receiver group will look like next week? Yeah, I, I don't think Jones may. I, I think Jones is going to be on the uh, uh, practice squad. Um, Jones, uh, I was on um, Purple Daily yesterday, and Judd said that Jones had, like, uh, was walking past the reporters, was sort of, like, said something that was, like, indicating he'd be on the team. But I'm wondering <laughs> if that was, like, you know, they tip him off in advance, like, oh, we're going to keep you this year. But, it, you know what I mean? Like, that it's more – that that was more indicative of the practice squad. Um, I, yeah, you're between five and six and the, and it's tough. Cause that's when it becomes like the three dimensional chess. Um, I think I had, uh, five when I, when I walked through it, but then I, like, I also changed my mind. Cause then it's like the, the six, you toss out the six names right there. Um, I'm going to say, but I'm going to, I'm going to stick with five. Uh, and I think if you're like the odd man out, I'm going to say is Sherfield. That's what I'll say right now is that Sherfield's the one that gets cut. So you have Jefferson, Addison, Naylor, Powell, and Tristan Jackson. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. The very last thing Thor, uh, because it is absolutely tis the season. Um, I follow you on Twitter and I know you've been very high on Kamani Vidal. If I'm saying that right. And Ricky Pearsall uh, on the 49ers, especially if Ayuk is jettisoned. Who are some other sleepers for folks' drafts that they need to snag? My favorite one is Luke McCaffrey. And I, mm -hmm. I fear now that the uh the barn is or how do you say the the horse is out of the barn? How yeah. do you say that one? That, yeah. That's it. On, on on that, like after the Dodson trade, there was like a spotlight uh shown on that. But like my whole thing with first of all, you know, you guys know, like I love McCaffrey in the pre-draft process. I thought he was way better than than you know the uh, consensus did or whatever he tested the same as as christian did like in the same physical package during the pre-draft process and he ripped it up both the years uh he played wide receiver uh he did it at rice uh you know conference usa but like it he was coming right from quarterback uh so the two years the two year sample that we have on him uh was amazing receiver play at at the college level and i just thought the his game fit so well with Jaden daniels Daniels likes to dial up the long balls and throw it downfield. You know, I talked about that with Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas during the, the pre-draft process uh, this past spring about the preponderance of deep shots, the slot fades, the goal balls uh, that were thrown to those two guys. Luke, Mc Luke McCaffrey can do that. And Washington had clearly soured on Dotson before. They were getting that out there of like, oh, he's he's not a lock for wide receiver too. And, you know, like all, all this stuff. And then it seemed like they were telegraphing the trade of Dotson in advance. Um, and I, I just think that McCaffrey, between the, the, the ability to show to Rice uh, on manufactured touches as well, uh, they gave him a, a – this is a kid that was a dual threat quarterback. Uh, so he is a good runner. You can manufacture touch for him. And then that, that downtown uh, ability that he has – very good uh, contested catch guy was one of the best in the nation. Doesn't drop balls. I, I think it projects as a guy who can get on the field right away. And now it's, it's wide open for him to get on there. And you still have the same level of enthusiasm <laughs> on Vidal and Pearsall. I mean, y yes. In, in terms of like, uh, you know, my evaluation on him, mm -hmm. both those guys have uh, uh, Vidal before was, there was some kind of he was dealing with something earlier in camp, but it looks like he he shook that. Uh, his last game was real good uh, when he got on the field, and then Pearsall has been dealing with this like weird shoulder thing, um, and you know it's like on and off. Like he needs to get he needs to get out on the practice field because you <laughs> might have a, a, a great opportunity here if Ayuk gets traded. Mm -hmm. um, you know where I'm sort of hoping that Ayuk doesn't go to the Commanders because then then my the wheels up on Luke yeah. McCaffrey they might go you know back into the plane a little bit for <laughs> for his rookie season, but 
yeah, I mean, like then it would open the door for Pearsall, who, who's another dude that I I loved. I I had Pearsall as a I think I ranked him 32nd on my board. I had him as a first round guy in April. I uh, really liked his game, but yeah, the injury might conspire to uh, hold back his timeline a little bit at the start of his rookie season. We'll have to see. Yannick, you got a final thing for Thor? Yeah, in, in all my dynasty leagues, that Whittington guy is, is trending from the Rams. Do you think I should get him, or is he too buried on the death, death chart? Oh, Jordan, Jordan Whittington? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm not a fan of Jordan Whittington. Uh, and I I'm, I was the Puka Nakua guy last summer, you guys recall. Like, And I, I've seen some people be like, oh, you know, Whittington, they, they like him. And, you know, he did a lot in this preseason game, so he could be the – this year's Puka, he, he's not Puka Nakua. Puka Nakua, BYU, he could go interchangeably between the boundary and the slot and his yards per route run and all the efficiency metrics when he was on the field were insane. When Jaron Hall got drafted, you can look this up on my Twitter. I, I was saying the only reason that this guy got drafted was because of Puka Nakua. <laughs> Jordan Whittington, it's sort of the opposite where this is a manufactured touch slot receiver. He's a glorified running back. It's like uh like a like a homeless man's uh, uh, Malachi Corley, you know it, it it's a dude like that like Amari Rogers, uh, and Amari Rogers was a much better version of that than Whittington was. Uh, uh, Lavisca Chanel would be another example of this, um, where they need their touches coming right around the line of scrimmage, and then in college when they were in space, um, then they would break a tackle or two, and that's how they generated their yardage. I understand in a preseason game where you're going up against the third stringers or the four stringers, and then they're doing these vanilla defensive concepts where it's dropping back in zone. You can see why it would be advantageous when that happens for the quarter, the third string quarterback of LA or whatever could just be like free completion, free completion, free completion to the dude who only hangs out within five yards of the line of scrimmage. And then he, Break a couple of tackles of guys that are going to be working at car washers in a couple of weeks. I, I'm not impressed with Jordan Whittington. You can't play him on the outside. He does not run routes. And the Rams are a team that have a bevy of slot options. So it's it difficult for me to envision in a game scenario where, you know, it's going to be like, let's pepper this guy within five yards of the line of scrimmage 10 times. That's our clearest path to victory here. There would have to be a biblical plague of injuries I, I do think he probably sticks on the roster just because there is a utility, but like it, it's like poor man's again, Amari Rogers or LaVisca Chanel. It's it's that sort of thing. That that guy will not be a difference maker. Don't waste the draft capital. Um, Yannick and I, I believe collectively have the Vikings checking in around seven and ten this year. Is that about where you're at, or are you lower? I'm I'm right around there. Yeah. Okay. Either either that or the six and eleven. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like I'm 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 right around there. And by the way, I'm cool with it. Mm-hmm. This isn't going to be popular amongst Vikings fans, but this again, this is the reset season. The fun starts next year. Um, you know, I was hoping that that the reset season would also provide a platform for me to watch my son JJ McCarthy uh, out there <laughs> develop a little bit this year. That was that's too bad, of course. You know that that we're deprived of that, but like it doesn't, you know. The scenario is is what it is. They just don't have uh, the roster on hand, I think, to do better than that. Darnell would have to be that to be a star, and you know, for the the boat to raise on that, I I doubt we, I, I doubt that that's what happens. So yeah, I'm I'm right around there, but uh, I'm going to be enjoying the season, hoping the guys develop and actively scouting that 2025 NFL draft. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> All right, man. Any any closing arguments for us? As far as like for the Vikings, anything, anything to get off your chest. Well, I mean, I just, you know, I'm thinking about, I want the Darnold, I want Darnold to play well enough to get that comp pick next off season. I want Aaron Jones to get play well enough to get that comp pick. That's where I'm at with the veterans on this team. And I think, um, you know, one other note I'll say that I didn't say before, you know, I mentioned that the running back class is, is really good this year. It's so deep in 2025 that, Merely that third round comp pick that you have, mm-hmm. you'll be able to get an immediate starting NFL running back with that pick. That's how deep the running back class is. So it, it'll be interesting to see if the Vikings in April, if, if they do indeed let Aaron Jones go. And then it's like, we're going to, you know, the pick we're going to devote to this. If they want to get closer to the start of that dance, of course, would require trades. You don't have a second round pick. Or, or how they do that. But you could just stay with that third-round comp pick and, and get one real quick. This running back class is friggin' loaded. 
That's awesome because I kind of hope they got one this past year, but they, they didn't really do anything at running back after Jones until yesterday when they got Mo Ibrahim. All right, Thor, we'll oh, talk to you in a bit. Welcome yeah. back, Mo, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Man, we'll I, talk to you. yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I, I remember uh, for Gopher fans, the, the game that was like one of the five lowest uh, wind chill games of all time when Iowa came to play the Gophers, uh, Ibrahim's last season. And PJ Fleck was just like, our whole game plan, we will literally give Mo the ball every single time. And it was against this just nasty Iowa defense that knew it was coming. And Mo still ground out like 200 yards, like on like 40 touches or something. And then at the very end of the game, they get like within the 10 yard line and Fleck just can't help himself. He just keeps giving the ball to Mo and Mo finally fumbles. Uh, and, and, you know, Iowa ends up winning. And then after the game, people are, oh, Mo, he, he fumbled in this big spot. It's like, it was negative 20 out there. Wind show. <laughs> and this guy, he wasn't even wearing long sleeves. They give it to him 40 times. He's getting beaten up by this absolutely elite, vicious defense that, that knows he's coming. It's like, the fact that he didn't have to get wheeled out in a stretcher was impressive. And and then people were complaining. But anyway, I, I really appreciate uh, Mo Ibrahim and I. I hope he stays around. Yeah, let's see if he's another uh, practice squad. He should actually play Saturday, I would think, with all of the uh, second and third, well, probably just third stringers. All right, For sir, sure. I was going to say, we'll hit your line probably after the 49ers game and maybe get a, or excuse me, after the Texans game and maybe get a three-game uh, sample under our belts. that sound all right? Sure, sounds good. Looking all forward right, to it. we'll talk to you next time. Thank you, Thor. All right, boys. Take it easy, Yannick. See ya.